Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Davis State of the City Address. My name is David Greenwald. I am the Executive Director of the Davis Vanguard. Uh, we are sponsoring this event tonight uh, so that the citizens of Davis uh, can hear from their mayor uh, about the state of our city, uh, what is happening, what has happened in the last year, and what we are facing in the next year. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mayor Joe Cravosa. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you very much to the Davis Vanguard for uh, sponsoring this and, uh, and getting it uh, going. Thank you to the city staff uh, for their work to, uh, to make the room available this evening. Uh, thank you as well to the Davis Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Chamber has had this uh, State of the City address for a number of years uh, at their January luncheon, and it was pointed out this year that it would be good to open it up in the evening and, uh, and invite everybody in to do this. And so also very, very pleased that we have Davis Media Access here uh, taping it uh, as well. So this is uh, maybe a little bit of a, a cliff notes of the city of Davis for the, for the coming year. Uh, I will note that I tried to uh, encourage my wife, Janet, to come. Uh, a, she came to the Chambers uh, version of this uh, and uh, she feels like she knows enough. So we didn't get Janet here tonight, but otherwise uh, that, that's it. Uh, so I'm going to begin by going through a number of things that, that happened in 2013 in the city and foreshadowing some of what that means for us as we uh, go forward as a, as a city. And as you might uh, suspect, I'm going to start uh, by talking a little bit about our water supply uh, project. This is the water that we all use in our homes uh, and outside of our homes. And as we all know, uh, in March, uh, Measure I was approved, and uh, by a vote of uh, 54 to 46, the residents of Davis decided to go forward uh, with a major new water su supply project to receive water from the uh, Sacramento River. Uh, we finished the, uh, the bids came in in June then for the project. Uh, the project is coordinated by the Woodland Davis Clean Water Agency. It's a joint project with the city of Woodland. Uh, the bids came in. And uh, in the fall, we, uh, we announced uh, the winner of the, of the bids. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done uh, in, uh, well, this is, a, this is a slide to show a little bit about where we, where we get our water, where we have been getting our water, and where we're going to be uh, getting our water. And so uh, this shows here, this line here is just about mid-2016, uh, when the new project will uh, come online. And you see uh, down the bottom here, we have the, this is the deep aquifer uh, underneath Davis, and this is the intermediate aquifer. We've been 100% dependent upon groundwater uh, up until uh, we get to mid-2016. Uh, and after 2016, uh, this, when the project comes online, uh, we're going to have surface water, um, you know, occupying this uh, level of service. Uh, we're still going to use our deep uh, wells a little bit, uh, in the summer, and there'll be a little bit of a backup. Uh, but because water rates are going up and because we value conservation, uh, this is our supply trajectory, and we project a 20, even a 25% reduction in water use in the community uh, through water conservation. One of the other things that we're going to do, which I'll talk a little bit about later, is we're going to convert some of our intermediate aquifer wells uh, to non-potable irrigation use. And that's just a smart use of water so that we're not paying a high price uh, for the water that we use uh, on, our, on our parks. So that's the project uh, supply, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about savings because after the residents of the city of Davis voted uh, to approve the project, uh, we really redoubled our efforts in the city of Davis and with Woodland uh, through the Woodland Davis Clean Water Agency uh, to bring water costs down. So the project cost in June of 2009 was $350 million. And by uh, June of, of 2013, we'd brought the cost down to uh, $228 million. So that's a savings of about 35% uh, over that, uh, that four-year uh, span of time. Now, a huge thank you here is due to the Water Advisory Committee, or the, or the WAC, that we assembled in the, uh, uh, in, in the city of Davis. Uh, the WAC uh, helped play a role, in fact, they recommended that 
we didn't need as much as we were planning for, and so we brought our use for the total project uh, down to 40 uh, million, uh, or down to 30 uh, million gallons per day from 40. And the Davis share of that is 12 uh, MGD. Uh, that work of the WAC is really responsible for no less than uh, 34, 35 million dollars uh, worth of savings. And then as we put the project out to bid from the Clean Water Agency, uh, in, in May of 2012, we said we're not going to accept uh, any bids that aren't 10 percent less than what the engineering estimates uh, were. And that was another 17.4 taken off the project. And then in June of 2013, we did the same and said uh, we wanted another 14.6 uh, off of the project. And then the final bid from CH2M Hill actually came in uh, not at the 151 that we were willing to take, but at 141. Uh, so this shows kind of how we brought the cost down. A couple other things on cost, the joint intake facility that we're building with the uh, Conaway Ranch uh, anticipated $32 million in federal and state matching funds and we're on target to receive all of those matching funds. So that's not a savings over what we anticipated, but it's good news that we are getting uh, what we anticipated there. The total Davis portion of the joint project is $107 million now. There'll also be the Davis side facilities once the water comes from that project is distributed into the city. Uh, but the big thing to watch in 2014, and I'm very excited about this, is the state of California has something called their revolving loan fund or their SRF uh, funding. And it's very possible that at the end of February, the State Water Resources Control Board uh, will approve our SRF uh, grant funding or our, our request for uh, low interest uh, financing for our project. And right now our assumption is that the funding for the project will be in the 5% range. Uh, our rates are based on that 5% range. And if we are successful in getting SRF funding, and we're very hopeful there, uh, the financing will be down in the high 1% range. Uh, that's a savings uh, over the 30-year payment uh, of that loan of somewhere in the 60 to 70 million dollar category. And so if we're successful there and we've been successful with the bids, uh, we're going to be very successful in bringing the overall project cost down uh, even, even further. That's exciting news. Now we all know that we have the, uh, the new rate structure in place and the rate structure that we've adopted here in Davis is one of the most conservation oriented rate structures in the state of California. It's going to make sure <coughs> that we limit our summer use and we want to limit our summer use because our summer use is what causes us to have to build more capacity uh, into the project. And so I think that with this work rate structure we're going to make sure that we never have to build new water infrastructure again for the city of Davis uh, and that's fantastic. What everybody should know looking forward to 2014 this year is that on May 1st until the end of October of this year that'll be the first period in which your six months of summer water use will be measured and that will determine your bill, uh, part of your baseline bill for 2015. So everybody now should be thinking right now really about how they might want to do anything to limit their May 1 to October 31st water use this year uh, because that's going to affect your rates in uh, 2015 at the beginning of 2015 and then in 2015 your six months of summer use will affect the baseline that you pay in 2016. That's how the rate structure is going to work. Uh, moving from the water supply project to uh, wastewater, uh, we have a new wastewater project coming online uh, in, the, in the city of Davis. And ah, I'm going to back up here just a little bit. I wanted to make sure that I stressed that while we've done lots of work to build our new water supply project, uh, the council made a commitment while we were doing that to make sure that we also had strong demand reduction in place. And so part of the demand reduction is the uh, new water rate structure, uh, but we uh, brought on uh, a firm to do a very uh, careful study, what we called our integrated water management uh, plan. And we looked at, you know, the unit cost of, uh, of saving certain acre feet of water and the present worth, uh, and we, we found, you know, ways to conserve water in the city that are the smartest ways to conserve water. And uh, the well conversion and what's called ASR are the best things that we can do. ASR is aquifer storage and recovery. 
So over time, what we're going to be looking at in the city of Davis is taking some of our river water in the summer, or in the winter rather, when it's plentiful, and putting it into the ground in some of our deep wells so that we can pull it back out uh, in times of, of shortage. Uh, that's the greater concept of conjunctive use, where you're conjunctively using both surface water and groundwater uh, and so on. What that means too, and I'd like to mention it because we're in our great drought now that we're seeing for 14, uh, or 13, 14, is that because the city of Davis is gonna have a diversified supply that's groundwater uh, and surface water going forward, uh, that puts us in a great position to manage uh, you know, reductions in water that come from drought. So the city is not anticipating this year to do any mandatory reductions in water conservation or water, uh, water you know, delivery to uh, residents. Uh, and we, uh, and that's a, we, we certainly encourage conservation, but we're not gonna have to do it because we've got this diversified portfolio. Okay, I'd like to uh, move uh, now to just making some reference to the, the wastewater project. And uh, this is the treatment of our wastewater that goes down our, our drains, uh, as opposed to the sewer water that, uh, that goes uh, out into the, the sewers and the streets. But the wastewater project is moving forward. It's going to be coming to council, as you can see, uh, in, the, in the spring. And one of the good things about the wastewater project is that the city of Davis saved uh, for a number of years to build up what's sometimes referred to as a sinking fund so that we'd have the money for the project when we got there. So we've slightly adjusted our uh, wastewater rates and we have the money now to proceed uh, with uh, uh, tertiary uh, treated uh, uh, water, which we really have to do for uh, heightened uh, discharge requirements uh, that have come from the state of California. So lots happening uh, on the waterfront. I want to now turn to uh, a little bit of a discussion about partnerships and uh, volunteerism. Uh, and as I think about the state of the city, and in my three-year tenure here as mayor, uh, I just want to observe that the city wor really works in incredible partnership with so many uh, different groups. And so we have uh, connecting our community and leveraging resources. Uh, one of the things we do is this nextdoor.com now. And if any of you are not on nextdoor.com, sign up. It's an incredible way to connect within your neighborhood. It's kind of a micro uh, Facebook, but people are sharing information, uh, whether it has to do with security or borrowing tools or uh, tips on gardening, um, wondering when the park is going to reopen or the pool is going to reopen, things like that. Uh, we have a new volunteer coordinator position at Davis Police Department to make sure we're leveraging uh, the resources of our uh, community. Uh, our arts and entertainment district has tremendous volunteerism coming into it, uh, both from the university and uh, downtown interests. And I do want to give special mention to uh, John Natsoulis at the Natsoulis Gallery, as he coordinates so many of the uh, creative artists in town and the downtown businesses uh, to really make the downtown more and more vital. Uh, we've got the Davis Farmers Market. We have the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame. We have the Hattie M Weber Museum for our history. Uh, we have International House helping us host so many people from around the world uh, that visit us through UC Davis. Uh, we have the Explore It Science Center enriching us in community education. Uh, we have Downtown Davis Association uh, promoting our downtown. And I love it when I run into people who say, Davis, California has the best downtown in all of Northern California. And of course, I accept that immediately uh, and, uh, and say thank you very much. Uh, but without downtown Davis, uh, we wouldn't have you know, as much attention on the streets and, and really a wonderful downtown uh, that we've got. We have the uh, Chamber of Commerce doing lots of activity now in economic development in town. And they helped with the, uh, the Gateway Project with UC Davis uh, to connect us more and more to the campus. And that does bring us to UC Davis, which is unquestionably our cornerstone partnership. And I'm very proud that this council over the last several years I believe has built up relations with campus uh, to a point that maybe have never been achieved before between town and gown in Davis, California. And a couple of things, uh, the campus is working in great coordination with the Yolo County Visitors Bureau to make sure that we're hosting visitors in a real seamless way. People come to campus, stay downtown, uh, fall in love with Davis, and that is only good for the campus. Uh, parents who come uh, to check out UC Davis are spending more time in Davis uh, to see you know, where their students are going to be, and hopefully that helps the campus recruit uh, exactly who they want. Uh, we're working very closely with UC Davis on their Vision uh, 2020 plan, which to, is to add 
5,000 more students and 300 more faculty to Davis. And we want to make sure that that's done in a truly integrated way. Uh, and finally, on the planning front, I'm very, very pleased. Uh, we'll see next month at Council uh, the preliminary joint planning between the city and the university for the Nishi parcel that's immediately to the south of campus. That's uh, potential for great economic development in the city. And then just in general, uh, we've, uh, we've gotten some funding now to finish the Third Street corridor between A and B Street to really open up that artery and make sure that students are flooding into downtown and when people are in downtown they know how to find their way onto campus. And we've opened up Old Davis Road now to connect uh, from its exit at I-80 uh, to downtown. All of these things I think are making uh, the city of Davis and the campus uh, more seamless in their connections. Now I'd like to turn a little bit to talk about uh, sust sustainability and uh, transportation. And I link these two because as all of you know, Davis is the first city in the state of California to have a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, those who critique that say we should be seeking carbon neutrality sooner and that 2050 is, is too long. But over 50% of the carbon in the city of Davis is generated from our transportation sector. So I really see uh, transportation and sustainability is very, very much uh, linked. So a couple of things that I'd like to uh, mention. First is uh, about two, two and a half years of work of our transportation advisory group has now revised the transportation element for the city of Davis and really pointing the way for how we can use Unitrans and paratransit and a better road network and a better bike network to make sure we're reducing carbon and providing mobility for everybody in the city. So a special thank you to the technical advisory group who's amended our uh, transportation element of our general plan. Uh, and on that score too, next month uh, we'll be receiving a report on the Bicycle Advisory Commission's development of what we call our Beyond Platinum uh, bike plan. And it's called Beyond Platinum because in 2005 the city of Davis was the first city uh, in the country to be named a uh, uh, platinum level bicycle friendly city by the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, and Boulder and Portland and Fort Collins have followed Davis uh, to join that distinction. Uh, but now the League of American Bicyclists have decided that platinum is not good enough and they've created a new diamond category. And so if we're going to achieve diamond status, uh, we're going to have to go beyond platinum. So we've got a new plan uh, that the Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, Commission has put forward for that. Uh, you know, in support of that, too, a year ago, uh, the staff uh, and I and council made a firm commitment too that we wanted to really go after regional grants uh, in the uh, bike area. And just uh, last month, in early December, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments approved $5.4 million of uh, bike transportation grants for the city of Davis, uh, spread over five different uh, proposals. Very, very exciting. And in addition to that, the city of Davis was part of a three-city SACOG proposal uh, to bring bike sharing to the city of Davis. And so we're going to have bike share stations around the city of Davis within about a year and a half. Uh, it's going to be part of a regional network that's going to be coordinated. And that was a $3.9 million grant that we were part of as well there. So we're really stepping up at the staff and the council level to plan for the future and get money for that. Now I want to give a special recognition to Cool Davis. Uh, to implement our goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, the city of Davis uh, helped create and now works in close partnership with Cool Davis. Uh, cool Davis is our nonprofit group to reach out to the community and make sure that we can be uh, sustainable. And you're going to see a lot from Cool Davis in this coming year. Uh, part of our goal is to have 75% of all households figure out what they can do to reduce their carbon. That's a very, very aggressive goal. But unless we have behavior change, and unless we retrofit a lot of the houses, unless we get people into more green cars, uh, we're not going to achieve that goal of carbon neutrality. Uh, one of the other great things that's happened in sustainability is we now have countywide, all the cities worked with Yolo County, uh, countywide PACE program. And PACE allows people to uh, borrow money and then repay it through their property tax for energy upgrades at their homes. And that's available for both commercial and residential um, uh, folks in, in, uh, in Yolo County. And so I hope all of you will look that up. It's through a company called Ygreen. Uh, it's on the city's website, it's on the county's website, and that's real progress uh, there. Um, 
The city put together an EV readiness grant this past fall. Uh, we knew uh, that more and more residents are driving electric vehicles. We're seeing uh, the Honda Fit EVs, the Nissan Leafs. We're seeing some Teslas around town. Uh, we've always had EV infrastructure in this town, but now it's time to step it up. And uh, last week, we received news that we received a $240,000 grant from the California Energy Commission for electric vehicle uh, readiness. So that's exciting uh, as, as well. Now also in the area of sustainability and energy, uh, the council has received two significant reports now on the possibility of creating a POU or a publicly owned utility uh, in the city of Davis. And there may be two big reasons that we do that. One is it would increase our ability to be part of our sustainability uh, future by designing programs that help uh, residents uh, lower their energy use. Uh, and also potentially there's great savings to the ratepayers uh, within Davis of going to a POU. And the study did indicate that we could reasonably save 20% um, compared to the current PG&E rates. Uh, this would be in the range of $103 million to $134 million discounted at 5% over 30 years. So uh, that's something that the council is taking very seriously. We need to go into that, uh, you know, really looking at all the numbers, uh, the costs involved. Uh, but there is progress being made toward uh, very serious consideration of a publicly owned utility uh, for Davis. Now, I also want to mention on sustainability, uh, solid waste. And this past year, the, the Natural Resources Commission of the city spent a tremendous amount of time looking into our goal of uh, zero waste for the city of Davis. Uh, concurrently, uh, we're kind of coming to the end or some opportunities to renew the contract with Davis Waste Removal. And so we've kind of brought all of that together, renewing the contract with Davis Waste Removal with the state of California requiring a 75% diversion rate of all of our stuff um, through the waste stream. And so you're seeing a lot that's going to be happening in waste. And uh, just this past week, uh, green waste containerization, which is part of that, came up as well. So we may be asking people to change their habits with regard to green waste to help get us toward that 75% uh, diversion rate. Uh, the green waste containerization kind of paves the way for being able to compost through the city. And so our food scraps and other compost material could all go uh, into our green bins and be handled by the, by the city in a coordinated way. Finally, in sustainability, I'm going to mention that we brought on um, an energy services company to be our partner to look for uh, kind of cost-effective ways to reduce energy use in the city. And the first example of this is going to be a swapping out of 2,600 street lights in the city of Davis, so the so-called uh, COBRA uh, lights uh, that are now uh, some technology, but they're all going to change to LED lights. And by switching those out, within five years, that will pay for itself. So here we have an example of where energy efficiency can save us dollars in the long term, and we're very excited about that. Um, there's still probably about 1,300 lights, I think, that are dispersed around in our parks and our green belts, and we're going to be looking at uh, how we replace those as well. But the COBRA ones, uh, are the first to, uh, to be swapped out, uh, and we're going to save money. I also want to, in the transportation area, just uh, give a little bit of a special thank you uh, to our Parking Advisory Committee. And we know that parking downtown uh, is a challenge. Uh, we also know that it's uh, complicated. And uh, we also know that it can be very expensive to add new parking. The estimated cost of adding a new parking space uh, downtown, if we were to build it, is $50,000 per space. So the council's view was before we head in the direction of adding a new parking structure at that kind of cost, the first thing we should look at is making sure that we're managing our existing spaces well. And so the Parking Advisory Committee was challenged with this. Uh, each council member appointed two people, and then we had uh, one or two at large, and they rolled up their sleeves. And this uh, slide just shows uh, the downtown area. Uh, about half of the parking is on street, about half of it is, is off street. Uh, and a number of creative uh, methods are, have, been come, uh, have been developed to make sure that we best use those spaces. Uh, one thing to know is that the parking structure at 4th and G now always has hundreds of vacant spaces in it, hundreds of vacant spaces. Now it's 4th and G, 
So if you park there, you've got one or two blocks. But the more people that we can move into the 4th and G lot, uh, we can use those hundreds of spaces that have already been paid for, in essence, by the city of Davis. So we need to use the existing resource. Something else you see downtown is there's lots of merchants that have private spaces that if we can open up those private spaces when they don't need them for their businesses, uh, we can uh, avoid having to buy new spaces as well. And part of this does mean going to paid parking downtown. So the council and the Parking Advisory Commission have recommended that, and it's been recommended, and it's been adopted. Um, it's probably going to be controversial. It is already controversial. Uh, but we're going to make sure that we've got the best technology and that it's as simple as possible. Uh, but that's probably what we have to do to make sure that employees downtown and those who can park a little bit further out uh, use the existing spaces that are available. Once we go through this, we'll be able to look at whether or not we really do need to spend a lot of money to build new parking uh, down, downtown. All right, with that, I'm going to move from transportation and sustainability to uh, economic uh, development. This has been a huge priority of the council and the community to make sure that we're leveraging off of the incredible uh, talent we have at UC Davis uh, to do economic development in the, in the city of Davis. And one of the uh, items I want to call out here is a wonderful group uh, called Tech Davis uh, that came together and offered to pay uh, half of the uh, salary uh, for the city of Davis to bring on a new chief innovation officer. And so last spring we brought on Rob White to be our new chief innovation officer so that there's really somebody who wakes up every morning thinking about how we can encourage economic development uh, in the city of Davis. Uh, we also partnered, the city did, uh, really was led by the Chamber of Commerce in taking us to the regional uh, cap to cap trip to Washington DC uh, where we promoted Davis and we see here kind of the, the cover of the uh, brochure, uh, kind of the, the leave behind that Davis created, uh, the chamber really uh, led and created uh, for our trip to, to Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, I want to say we're partnering lots with, uh, uh, with UC Davis. Uh, I think many of you know about the Davis Roots collaboration, where Davis Roots is a nonprofit organization in the community that looks for young startups from UC Davis. And we partnered by uh, providing the Hunt Boyer Mansion downtown so that there's a physical space. And the idea is that if we help those companies when they're young for a year or 18 months or two years and we help them get established, they'll plant themselves, they'll stay uh, in Davis. If you look at why companies locate where they locate, almost always the top reason is where the founder wanted to live. And so if we can make sure that when the company is young, uh, the founder puts their uh, child or children in our schools and they find a place to live and their spouse uh, finds a job, uh, then we've got a great chance of keeping them in Davis. And so they'll go from 3 to 10 to 30 and maybe more employees here in Davis if we can help them when they're young. So I think that's a, a great program that we've uh, had here in Davis. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Tech Davis again uh, because in some of the funding they've been able to receive, uh, they've provided $250,000 to Davis Roots, uh, $250,000 to a wet lab incubator startup so that we can support wet lab companies uh, in Davis, and $100,000 to our, our hacker lab. And I might have those numbers just a little bit off, uh, but am I close uh, on those? I think so. It's uh, Capital Corridor Ventures. Got it. Capital Corridor Ventures is uh, providing the, the funding, but this shows you know, good partnerships uh, coming together and helping economic development in the city. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to also recognize our Innovation Park Task Force. And so uh, in the fall of 2010, the city said the number one thing we can do for business development is to figure out where the lands are uh, in and around the city of Davis that could be developed for business parks. And the Innovation Park Task Force uh, identified about 450 acres uh, over four uh, areas of the city. Uh, one was the uh, Nishi property just south of UC Davis. We also have the idea of an East Innovation Park just outside the 200 acres, just outside the Mace Curve. Uh, we also have the idea of a West Innovation Park, which would be uh, near the Sutter uh, Hospital. And then we also want to recognize that the downtown is itself uh, what we'd call a downtown innovation district. And we want to do everything we can downtown 
uh, for the downtown to be able to host uh, companies of small and, uh, and moderate um, size. Uh, the task force is now going to kind of restart itself uh, with great vigor, and I want to announce that on January 27th, uh, next Monday night at 5.30 uh, in these community chambers, uh, the Innovation Park Task Force will be meeting again, and they'll continue to meet on the fourth Monday of every uh, month, and those meetings will be videoed and broadcast. And so if you want to follow uh, how the city is proceeding with opening up lands uh, for uh, business, uh, this is where the, where the uh, decisions are going to be made. Uh, with that, I'd like to move now to um, some things in the uh, land use and planning uh, area of the city. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Old Davis Road now connects in. That's a good thing with uh, the university. But of course, the biggest item in 2013 uh, was, the, was the cannery uh, development. And the council has approved 550 uh, new dwelling units, approximately, in the city of Davis. Uh, they'll be just north of Covell and uh, just east of the, of the railroad tracks. Uh, there's uh, tremendous sustainability elements uh, within uh, this proposal. Uh, it's, it's higher density, it's uh, mixed use. Uh, there will be 1.5 uh, kilowatts of solar on every uh, residential roof, and the multifamily units will have solar on them uh, as well. Also, what's innovative is that 25%, uh, I think, of the first 100 homes uh, are going to uh, have to be uh, zero net electricity. And then that'll kind of get the ball rolling for people moving in if they would like that option to be able to opt for that option above the uh, 1.5 kilowatts of solar. Now, a big piece of the sustainability, though, is making sure that cannery uh, is, a, is a bikeable community. And as I mentioned, with 50%, over 50% of our carbon coming from transportation, we want to make sure that anybody who moves into cannery has great bike access to the rest of the city. But of course, the boundary on the south, the only entry and exit from Cannery, uh, is Covell Boulevard. And so the council, concurrent with the development of the Cannery uh, project, uh, put together a uh, Covell Corridor uh, and Cannery Connectivity uh, Plan. And so this shows uh, we'll have, uh, have Cannery uh, kind of right in here, uh, but we're, we're making sure that uh, bikes uh, and cars and the traffic lights that are in here are all going to work well. And in particular, uh, the council uh, sought and really received cooperation and funding from the developer to make sure that we have grade separated bike crossings at the southwest and the southeast of the Cannery project. And that was uh, you can have a great piece of collaboration uh, between all parties to get as much money as we could for that, and we'll be working carefully to make sure that those uh, grade separated crossings are as effective as, uh, as possible, and make sure we have as many people on bikes in the community uh, as, we can, as we can get. I also want to recognize in land use planning uh, that using our Measure O funds, uh, the city is preserving 391, and I think the number is actually changing as we do the surveys, but approximately 400 acres uh, outside the Mace Curve that'll be just outside uh, the East Innovation uh, Park that we have uh, planned. And so that's a major use of our Measure O funds uh, to preserve open space right on our, right on our border. Uh, I also want to recognize in land use planning uh, UC Davis's West Village. Uh, it's not within the city of Davis, uh, but just west of 113 and south of Russell, uh, we have now uh, over 2,000 uh, new residents living in uh, multifamily housing with 350 single-family homes planned. And I mention this because the city wants to be a great host to UC Davis. But if housing comes in the city of Davis, there's only a percentage of the people that will move in that will actually be uh, UC Davis uh, staff or faculty or students. But if new housing happens on UC Davis land and UC Davis still has a land lease, then they can set the rules for who moves in. And when houses uh, first come up, they can be occupied by UC Davis faculty and staff. And when they turn over, the preference can be for UC Davis faculty and staff. And I think that that's one of the best ways that we can make sure that a high percentage of those who work at the university are able to live in our community. Uh, it will certainly continue to have many university employees that move into 
new areas developed in town, but over time, the university numbers might, might go down. So I'm very, very pleased that with West Village, we're going to have more people commuting less and living closer to where they work. I mean, that's good uh, on so many different levels for, for our community. Uh, West Village is also the nation's largest planned zero net energy community. And that's very exciting to have that in Davis as well. The first year audit now, the first full year audit for West Village is in. And West Village achieved 87% of the energy used at West Village uh, was generated on site at West Village. So now they're going to redouble some of their efforts at energy efficiency, and they're going to increase production from just solar uh, to also having a biodigester out there. So that's another big piece in land use planning and sustainability uh, for, our, for our community. I want to talk now a little bit about uh, downtown density. And one of the big issues before the council has been how do we kind of carefully uh, respecting our great culture of the downtown, but also move it toward higher density. And these are two uh, projects that the council has approved in the last uh, year or two. One is the Parkview Place uh, development. This is right at uh, 4th and D Streets. And that is up now. And it gives us an opportunity to see what three stories uh, downtown uh, looks like. This has four uh, residential uh, living spaces in it, and then it's uh, support uh, garage space for those and mixed use on the bottom floor. And the council has also approved uh, the Mission residences on B Street, just a little bit above uh, 2nd Street on the west end side of the street. And uh, these units as well are going to go up. It's going to give us a chance to see how we do uh, with those and how they fit with the community. Um, uh, Central Park uh, West is another um, uh, set of seven units right across from Central Park. So. Watch these, uh, know that the council is interested, and uh, I think these are going to kind of give us data points on how we go about increasing the density uh, downtown. Now I'd like to move to uh, fiscal sustainability, and this has probably been the most consuming uh, issue uh, for me and our council over the past uh, three, uh, four years or so. And I want to make some observations here. Uh, about 80% of the city's budget is uh, labor costs. And so when we think about how we're going to make sure we have room in our budget for a lot of the amenities uh, that we enjoy in the city of Davis, maintaining our, our parks, keeping our roads in good shape, uh, we have to be focused on labor. We're also going through and coming out of now you know, what's referred to as the Great Recession. We've seen cities from Vallejo to Stockton going into bankruptcy. And the city is at to work very, very hard to make sure that we weren't uh, in that category of, of city. Uh, and we, of course, uh, enjoy a high degree of services. So if we're going to keep doing that, we have to be very, very uh, co uh, cost conscious. And there's different components to how we you know, make sure we're doing OK on the cost side. But I want to point out to everybody that since the 07-08 uh, year, when the city had 464 employees uh, through attrition and in a very limited instance uh, some layoffs, we've uh, reduced from uh, 464 employees at the city to 361. So over 100 employees have been reduced from the city's payroll. Uh, that's a reduction of, of 22%. Uh, percent. Uh, and it's been very hard, but I think we've done that in a way that's gotten close to uh, or has maintained services uh, within, the, within the city. Uh, probably the most um, publicized of staffing cuts have revolved around our fire department, where we used to have 12 firefighters on duty 24-7. Uh, and now, through council action, we've reconfigured how we deploy our uh, fire staffing, and we've gone from 12 to 11. Uh, but I will make the point that that is still uh, much less of a staffing cut than the city as a whole uh, has, uh, has, has had. We've also uh, made sure that within fire, we've maintained our levels of service uh, by doing a boundary drop with UC Davis, which means that we're operating those two uh, fire departments really as, as one. And we've consolidated the upper levels of management with, uh, with UC Davis. This was something proposed actually by Senator Lois Wolk and the campus back in 1994. And we've now achieved that with this council. Uh, 
the consolidation of upper level fire management will result over time in up to $200,000 of savings and reducing the uh, staffing from 12 to 11 brings us somewhere around $450,000 a year in savings. And as we'll see when we go a little bit further, uh, those are really quite significant uh, for us. So uh, we also uh, proved uh, just in the last, uh, uh, last December of 2012 right at the end of the year prior, uh, we uh, proved uh, labor MOUs with five out of our seven uh, labor groups. And with two of our labor groups, we weren't able to come to agreement, um, but we've now, um, we've kind of imposed last, best, and final on DCEA and the fire department, uh, and so we go forward there. So we have in place now contracts with all seven of our labor uh, negotiating uh, groups. Now, there's, uh, uh, there's a couple things to say about the budget, but if we hadn't gone through all the cost cutting that we've gone through over the last 18 months or so, uh, we would be facing probably about five million more in annual costs on our approximately 40 to 42 million dollar general fund. Um, so really very, very significant um, savings that we've, uh, that we've achieved. Now, uh, I want to say that we're, we're kind of getting as real as we can in all of the accounting of the city. Uh, we don't want to have a budget that's built on any kind of uh, gimmicks. And so I want to show a couple of things here. Uh, one of the biggest parts of our uh, labor costs are our, our PERS costs, the public employee retirement system that we participate in with the state of California. And if you ask the Calif state of California how much uh, PERS uh, contributions are required from the city, uh, they'll kind of tell you up to this point, and then it's kind of implied that it's going to stay flat. Uh, but our city, uh, Davis, has kind of looked as, as accurately we can into the crystal ball, and we really see uh, that for uh, general employees of the city, we see pension costs going up. We just don't see any way uh, that if the state keeps its promise of a defined benefit, uh, to uh, the employees of the state that we participate in, the system we pers participate in, uh, that, the, that there's going to be anything near a flat cost. And so our budgets for Davis anticipate this. Uh, we're, we're saving for this, we're budgeting for this to make sure our budget is as real as possible and we don't have surprises. For public safety employees, uh, we see an even steeper rise because uh, we have earlier retirements and higher percentages there. And so we're trying to be as real as possible as we can on these, uh, on these uh, pension costs. Uh, another thing that we're doing at the city is trying to make sure that we don't, we're not deferring uh, long-term costs that we really should be uh, spending uh, dollars on today. And the biggest area for this is roads. And we're probably under, we've probably got about a $30 million deficit in the amount of roads uh, funding that we should have. And I put this chart up here to show uh, that if you, uh, when, when pavement is in good condition, uh, it's at maybe 40% of, of its life, you can uh, maybe spend $4 to $7.50 per square yard uh, to slurry seal it or cap seal it, and it doesn't cost that much to keep it in good shape. But if you wait until pavement is at 75% or 90% of, uh, of its life, then the costs just become tremendous. Twenty-six, twenty-seven uh, dollars per uh, square yard, sixty-one to eighty-one dollars per square yard when you get up into the ninety percent level. And so, the city council has worked very hard to try to figure out where we're going to find money so that we can repair our roads as soon as possible, so that these costs don't multiply. And if we were, were to really get on top of this, it would probably be something around five million dollars per year. Uh, that we should be spending on our roads. But on a budget of 40, $42 million general fund budget, that is a lot of money. That's well over 10%, as you know. Uh, so we're putting somewhere around two to three million away now in our budgets to start to, quite frankly, slow the deterioration of our roads. But it's not really gonna be uh, as far as we wanna go, but it's the best we can, uh, we can do now. But I wanna, I want everybody to know that the council is paying close uh, attention to this. So as we look to the, the budget ahead uh, for the city, uh, our next budget will be our 13-14 uh, general fund uh, budget. 
And we really are now at about a um, four and a half to five million dollar uh, structural deficit in the city. And so the black line shows the predicted structural deficit uh, for the city of Davis. And the red shows the um, kind of accumulation of the, the fund balance. And if we were to do nothing, you'd be you know, out in the 1819 budget with a $28 million uh, deficit. Uh, so even with all of the belt tightening that we've done at the city, uh, we're still looking at a, a situation uh, like this. And that really does mean uh, that we need to uh, think about some sort of a revenue measure uh, for the city of Davis. Uh, that'll come to the council actually uh, next Tuesday night. And we've had uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Wolk and Council Member Lee kind of looking at the ways uh, that we can do this. Uh, the lead idea is probably a half cent sales tax uh, increase that we could put on our June 3rd uh, election. Uh, could be a parcel tax, uh, we'll consider that uh, as well. But if it were a half cent sales tax that the council uh, were to adopt in a week, uh, that might bring somewhere between 3.5 and 3.7 million dollars a year into our general fund. Uh, that is, quite frankly, still you know, not enough to meet this, uh, meet this structural deficit. So even with a revenue measure, we probably have to have uh, further belt tightening uh, at, the, uh, at the city. Uh, with that, um, the other one cost item I wanted to mention is water. Uh, the city pays for its water just like the residents uh, pay uh, for their water. And so we're looking at conservation measures uh, throughout the city to make sure we bring our water costs down. And the first move here is probably our well 11 uh, that's in Community Park. And we're going to be shifting that well onto uh, watering just uh, the park. Uh, and some of the school district uh, fields to, to save, uh, save money. And that was part of one of the conservation measures that I mentioned a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, so just uh, concluding on budget, you know, the good news would be that we've, uh, we've tightened things down. Uh, the bad news is that we've still got um, further, uh, further and further to, uh, to go. And long-term economic development is going to be a source of revenue for us, uh, helping us on the property tax front and the sales tax front. Uh, but that is more uh, long term. I'd like to mention a couple of things looking forward to uh, 2015 uh, now. Um, water project cost savings, which I mentioned. Uh, that's very exciting and then seeing how that might help us uh, reduce uh, the water rate increases that we're uh, anticipating. Uh, on the revenue front, I mentioned as well, we probably have to look at a revenue measure uh, coming on the ballot in June. And we actually have to declare that we're going to put that on the ballot in February so everybody will see uh, that coming up. Um, with UC Davis, I'm very, very excited. Our work on what we call the Downtown University Innovation District and this Nishi property, uh, that has been talked about for years and years. Uh, and this council and our staff now are really moving on that project uh, with, with campus. Uh, I foresee continuing increases in partnerships within the city where we look to great, great community groups uh, to work with us more. I want to make sure that the city is in as good a position to support those partnerships as possible. Um, swim America on the swim front, uh, Davis Diamonds and the gymnastics front, uh, Explore It on the uh, education front. Um, uh, we're gonna have a wonderful community build uh, this spring. Uh, this council has been working with uh, the uh, innovation, the, the downtown arts and entertainment folks uh, on the area around the first and F uh, Regal Theater. Uh, that you know, gets a little bit dark and it's not real creative around there and so we're going to be sprucing that up and adding some benches and adding some art and there's going to be a huge community build group coming in to do that volunteer work uh, for us. Uh, volunteer day will be uh, April 26th and we anticipate getting uh, hundreds of people out onto the Davis streets uh, for that volunteer day. One of the things that I talked about last year in my State of the City address too was the creation of a Davis Community Foundation. Uh, we all know that this is a very generous community to so many of our nonprofits, uh, but the city doesn't really have kind of a glue that encourages philanthropy. And increasingly in communities, community foundations play uh, two important roles. Uh, one is they can help facilitate what are called donor-directed funds, uh, where people can give their money to a community foundation when they have a tax need to do that, and then they can designate those funds in a different 
uh, calendar year uh, for a charity of their choice. And we want to set up that mechanism here in the city of Davis. Um, and then that helps also, uh, the community foundation can help with planned giving. We have a, a tremendously active uh, and aging population in Davis. Uh, they're certainly setting up wills and have an interest in giving back to the community in which they raised their children and they grew up themselves. And so uh, planned giving and helping people uh, do that will also benefit our nonprofits in town. So those are things to look forward to. Perhaps the biggest challenge I'd like to uh, indicate for the city is, is the council continuing to interact with the incredibly engaged public that we have. And uh, I get so many emails every day from people on so many different issues. My colleagues on the council do uh, as well, and our city staff are constantly uh, handling inquiries uh, that I think one of our greatest challenges is communication. And our website is going to be redone in the next uh, month or so in the city of Davis to make sure that people can touch the city more. I want to encourage everybody, when you get interested in an issue, to go to our website and find the staff report. And I think you'll be absolutely impressed at how outstanding the staff work is in the city and how much we think through things. And so if you're concerned about water conservation or, or solid waste, read the staff report and just see all the considerations that went into uh, the city ordinance that's guiding us in those areas. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming here uh, this evening. I'd like to thank the Vanguard again uh, for hosting this State of the City address. And I'd like to uh, open this up for uh, any questions that we've got from the audience on, on topics. And I'm delighted that the State of the City uh, is taking on a higher profile and that uh, in the future we'll have uh, our other mayors uh, coming up here and uh, talking about the city and making sure we have as strong a dialogue as possible with our citizens. So thank you all very, very much for being with us tonight. Okay. Um, Stacy has got a, a microphone and uh, if anyone would like to uh, ask a question or, or two, I'd be, delighted to, uh, I'd be delighted to answer. Okay, so let's get the, let's bring the mic. Uh, so my understanding was that you said that um, 80, uh, that labor costs represented 80% of the budget and that there had been a reduction of 22% by attrition and a few layoffs. And so I'm wondering if that 22% um, reduction was enough to change that percentage of costs? I think that we're, we're you know, the, uh, it, it's getting better, uh, or, or it, may be, it may be coming down. I haven't seen the new number since the last budget when we were uh, pushing up toward 80. But even as, as we bring uh, the 20, the 22% has been over the last uh, seven years, um, so we're still kind of in a small percent uh, per, per year. Uh, but I think that's something that we'll watch. One of the things we've done with uh, retiree benefits, so-called OPEB, other post-employment uh, benefits, is to, is to absolutely make sure that uh, long-term uh, we're putting in money now uh, that we can always uh, keep our obligations for retiree health to our employees. And that does mean that we've increased some of our payments uh, to make sure that the benefits are solvent long-term. So while we've brought uh, uh, certain, we, we reduced staffing overall. In our most recent labor MOUs, we also gave modest salary increases to our employees, uh, but we also made sure that we were kind of fully funding the things that are non-salary. So there's, there's trade-offs uh, within that. Next question. This isn't a question, but it ties into two of the things you said. The water project, there's an open house at the Senior Center on Thursday at 6.30 for anyone who wants to meet the contractor who is going to be building the surface water plant. And tomorrow night is the first meeting of the Covell Corridor Task Force, I think also at the Senior Center? I'm not sure. Uh, is it at the Senior Center? Do we know? There was an article in the newspaper about it. Might be the best. We'll find out before it's we. It's a very, uh, very lively week this week. That's right. And tomorrow there's a brown bag uh, downtown on parking media, meters. So, uh, where is the, uh, where is the, uh, the Covell Corridor meeting uh, tomorrow night? Is what time? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Six o'clock tomorrow night at the Vet Center. The Covell Corridor uh, presentation will be made, 
And then uh, 6 o'clock at the Senior Center on Thursday evening, we'll have Meet the Contractor, which is CH2M Hill, for the Regional Water Project. And tomorrow downtown, we'll have uh, parking meters uh, at a brown bag lunch of the uh, Davis Downtown, I believe. Good. At the Pence Gallery. Good. So all kinds of community engagement going on on the projects of the city. So next question. Is it on? So I have a question about <clears throat> the state mandated diversion rates because I don't totally understand this. When you say we have a 75% state mandated diversion rate, that's based on our what, like what number, what we're diverting now? What it's it's 70% uh, of our waste needs to be diverted from the landfill. So it's 70% so based on when we were, like what number? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a baseline because for a long time the goal was 50%. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, five years ago or so, uh, we met, other cities met the 50%, and now the new goal is 75% diversion. And there's actually a fair amount of debate about what's included in that 75%. And so the, one of the, the challenges of the NRC was, you know, what, what the baseline was. So I understand your question, and, and I'm not capable of answering okay, I was just right curious, now. So but because if we, because as I understand it, David has a pretty good diversion rate already. Right. So there are, so we're actually expecting like 75% of 80% or 50% is yeah. much harder. Like it's almost like if we're already diverting, it's actually right. a bigger burden. So, and we actually, we, we are not as good as we, we, we should be. Okay. I mean, we certainly met the 50%, but there are communities that recycle their, or that, that take compost uh, and have a much higher diversion rate than the city of Davis uh, does. I mean, d it depends again how you count it, but after we got past our 50%, you know, we're somewhere, I think, in the, the mid to low 60s now. So we've still got a ways to go to get to the, to get to the 75. But the 75 is not on top of our current success. The 75 is on top of what we, what okay. we what we disperse from our homes, so yeah. So there's the same baseline with with other communities, and there are and there are communities in California that have already uh, moved past 75 um, percent. We've we've still got a challenge, and that's okay. why we're that's, that's we're looking at it very very closely. One of the things we're going to do in our new contract with Davis Waste Removal is we're going to have very aggressive performance standards, and I'm very proud of this. Uh, uh, Councilmember Frerichs and I worked uh, closely on this. Uh, we're going to have very strong performance standards so that our waste hauler is, is going to be paid more if they meet certain targets in diversion. And the view is that the waste hauler, DWR in town, knows more than anything about what's really going on on the street and they're, they're best able to you know, do the outreach to our citizens and tell us just what we should be doing differently. Uh, and I think that sets up the right incentives for us to get to 75% as fast as possible. Do we have another question here? Alzada. Yeah, I was just wondering how much uh, research uh, has gone into looking for maybe private sector solutions for some of the services that uh, Davis delivers to us uh, uh, since the 80% the is a really high figure of, right. uh, towards the total budget. Has the private sector been looked at for yeah, I think there's I think there's a couple uh, ways to, to 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 address that. I mean, one uh, is that um, you know, in my my personal experience, uh, you can often find that when you when you contract out, um, you know, you can become very dependent upon a private party, and then the next time you bid it out, uh, you're not in as uh, competitive a, a situation. But we do look at areas. For example, the water project mm -hmm. is without any question. Uh, the biggest new cost of the city, and we're, we're certainly bidding that out. And we're not only bidding out the, the design and the construction, uh, but we did go with operate as well. So we did what's called a design bid operate contract. And the bidder, uh, CH2M Hill, the successful uh, bidder on it, has to operate the project for 15 years. And what that meant was that you made sure that the person that designed it knew that they were going to have to build it, and the person who built it knew that they were going to have to operate it. So it wasn't just uh, do it and then you know, move on. And we found that um, in the cost then, the overall cost to the community is locked in, because we know exactly what the operation costs are going to be for this very expensive water project uh, for the next 15 years. We also found kind of a nice co-benefit, which was in energy savings. Because if they know that they're going to operate it, they want to have um, 
uh, operating costs as low as possible. And we did something with, uh, with the DPO contract where we said, uh, we're gonna set an energy use number that is kind of the best practices for what it would cost to process that amount of water. And if the bidder saves uh, more uh, and or saves, uses less energy than the baseline that we've set, uh, then um, they get half of the savings and the ratepayers get half of the savings. And if they use more energy than we've predicted they should, uh, then in fact uh, they have to swallow that and it comes out of their profit. So we created an energy uh, incentive there. The, the other piece on the privatization is uh, the idea, I think, that we just work with so many great community partners on different projects. So we have a great, great core staff, um, but some of our recreation now is popping up as, as private recreation. And so that relieves you know, us from doing that in the city. Maybe we would be able to do it, maybe we wouldn't uh, be able to do it. Uh, but I think there is a, there's kind of a trend in, in that direction. But we also want to have outstanding core staff with that institutional memory long term, and we've certainly got that in the city of Davis now. I think, you know, I will add too that there is a great movement uh, in Yolo County and in the region toward what we call shared services, uh, where we look at what other jurisdictions are doing where we could team up and the uh, consolidating the upper levels of our fire management is a great example of shared services in the city of Davis, kind of staring us in the face to make sure we're coordinating uh, UC Davis and City of Davis uh, fire uh, management at the highest levels. And I think we'll continue to look at that. There's a lot of interest at the county in doing that. Uh, we do that in animal services, for example, in the county. All of the cities bundle their dollars together so that we have one uh, animal services facility in, in Woodland. And I think shared services will continue to be um, at the fore as well. Okay. Question? Yeah, you mentioned earlier, um, I, I saw it floated the other day about a municipally owned could you talk about why that might be cost effective? My understanding from past campaigns is that um, our current provider campaigns very um, aggressively against those sorts of initiatives and how, how Davis could do that and, and save money. Right. So, uh, you know, I would just, I would uh, commend to everybody the, the, the two studies uh, that have come before us on a, a publicly owned utility. And you just you just you just crunch the the, the numbers, uh, and there's you know there's different charges on your utility bill and so on, and some of those uh, you know certainly go to the go to the PG&E today, uh, but if we were to take over, we would uh, do it ourselves, and we would capture those uh, dollars. Uh, you know the question is, um, you know what's the cost of providing the the service, and what would the cost be of purchasing the infrastructure? Now, if we go forward with a publicly owned utility. Uh, we're looking just on the electricity side. It wouldn't be feasible on the natural gas uh, side. Uh, but the, the numbers we have is that over a 30 year period of time, uh, between uh, 100 and 130 million dollars could be uh, saved by the community. And in addition, you know, some of our ratepayer dollars could be put into programs that would help people save money and meet our sustainability objectives. Now PG&E is doing uh, sustainability objectives now, there's no question about it. But for example, one of the great interests of this community, a bill sponsored by Senator Wolk, uh, was to allow Davis to have uh, community solar, where the city could put up the land, uh, our residents could uh, pay in their private dollars, and we could create a large solar array uh, on the edge of the city, and you'd receive a bill credit, uh, almost as though you had the solar on your roof, but we'd be able to build the big array uh, with economies of scale. And there's many people in Davis who can't have solar on their roofs because they're apartment dwellers or because uh, they've got shade or uh, they don't want to put it on their roof because they don't want to replace the roof quite yet uh, or they've got a lot of turrets and tile or something like that. Uh, and that's something that the utilities have not been in favor of. So we take a little bit more control of our energy destiny if we were to go to a POU. But the dollars are um, something we have to be very careful about. If we're going to move in this direction, we're going to ask the citizens to trust us. We have to make sure that it's really going to, really going to pencil out. There's no question about that. So um, everyone who wants to follow this should. Uh, the reports are all there, and uh, we'll we'll see where we end up. Good. Another question. Well, or an observation, if that's okay. Please. Um, and perhaps a suggestion. One thing I saw missing from your presentation was much with regard to health, wellness, and safety. And so I'd like to see updates on that. 
Good, good. So on, you know, on the safety side, certainly uh, roads uh, are, you know, are part of that. Um, you know, typically it's the counties that are more involved uh, in, in health, but there's a couple things that, that I will mention. One is that uh, all of the cities in Yolo County uh, have a wonderful 10-year uh, uh, plan to eliminate homelessness, and we're collaborating on that. And that's a very complicated web of different um, social services uh, where we bring the cities and the counties together. We have Davis Community Meals uh, here in, in town, and we have our interfaith rotating winter shelter, uh, but we need to coordinate more on that. Um, and I will mention, and I'd like to acknowledge too, uh, that our council made a decision not to uh, fluoridate our water, uh, but concurrently made a commitment to make sure that we're working for dental health uh, countywide. Uh, and I'm watching to make sure that we kind of uh, hold to our commitment there um, because we're not going to use our water supply to fluoridate. We do have an obligation to make sure we do things to reduce uh, the caries rates in our, in our community. And I think our council is very interested in overall, you know, health and welfare. And so I'd encourage citizens that, you know, have ideas in that area to come to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it fits into the category of how we can effectively partner uh, to make sure that we're not doing everything as a city, uh, but we're facilitating as much as we possibly can uh, within, our, within our borders to improve the quality of life in Davis. So. More questions? Uh, we have city staff here today, too. We have our chief innovation officer, uh, Rob White, if there were any questions for Rob in the area of economic development. Uh, we have uh, Stacy Winton with us. Stacy is really our outreach coordinator uh, for the city. She, she does the fantastic Davis uh, Neighbors Night Out, you know, 120 plus parties uh, that we host in the fall. Uh, we also have uh, Yvonne Query with us. Uh, Yvonne's our deputy city manager and handles the whole finance side. Uh, for uh, for the city of Davis. So if there's any questions of them, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, bring that up. You know, let me uh, mention one issue, too, that I didn't have on my outline, but it really is going to affect everybody in the city of Davis uh, in the next uh, couple months, really, and that is we're going to complete our Fifth Street uh, redesign project, the so-called road diet for the city of Davis, uh, from A through L. And it turns out in the city of Davis, we have about uh, 65 uh, plus thousand people and, and probably uh, about 64,000 traffic planners uh, who all have a, an opinion about the Fifth Street project. And I want to make a couple of points. The number one reason uh, that we're doing the Fifth Street project in Davis is for safety. A disproportionate number of our accidents, um, car on car, uh, car on pedestrian, car on bike, are in the corridor from A through L Street uh, on, uh, on Fifth Street. And uh, to address this, we're going to go from four lanes on Fifth Street down to two lanes, but we're going to have dedicated left turn lanes. And for traffic, people are very, very concerned because intuitively, if you go from four to two, uh, the idea is that it's not going to be uh, as good. And so I want to make it clear that the speed through that corridor will be diminished but safety will certainly go up. But the travel time from A to L will be reduced on average by 45 seconds. The travel time from A to L uh, on Fifth Street will be reduced on average by 45 seconds. So you'll go slower, uh, but you won't stop as much. You won't have to stop when somebody wants to take a left turn. It won't back up traffic because they'll go into a dedicated left turn lane. And the big way that this uh, happens is because the signals at F and G will go from three phase to two phase. So right now, if you're at F and G and you miss the light, you have to wait through two phases, um, uh, the traffic going the opposite way on Fifth Street and then the north-south traffic happening. And so when we go to two phases there, that's going to really change everything right around uh, F and G. Might be a little bit harder if you're crossing from south to north or north to south uh, and you're trying to get across Fifth Street. But I think people's behavior will change. They'll turn left and then they'll get in the left-hand turn lane and they'll turn, uh, they'll turn right, get in the left-hand turn lane and then turn left. So you might jog one block either way, but it'll actually, I think, be easier to get across Fifth Street now uh, with, the, with the redesign. Uh, and then we're going to have bike lanes there. And so uh, everybody's very frustrated when we see bikes on Fifth Street because it feels so unsafe. It makes drivers very, very nervous. Uh, but the bikes also have the right to be there. So uh, as long as we have great bike paths on Fifth Street uh, that are west of A and also that are 
uh, east of L, people are going to want to ride a bike on Fifth Street, and we're going to provide a safe way for them to go forward and do that. So I hope everybody will be a little bit patient, but it looks like uh, the data is there that this is going to be a good thing. I also think that the Fifth Street redesign is going to be very good for downtown, because as people go slower uh, through the A to G uh, corridor, I think they may be a little bit more inclined uh, to turn off of Fifth and, and visit downtown as opposed to feeling like they're just going through a, a quick gauntlet. And we're going to hopefully get more people from Old North Davis, uh, pedestrians, to walk into downtown. So we'll get more connectivity uh, between the neighborhood to the north uh, and, and downtown. So Fifth Street is another big thing that's uh, coming up uh, for everybody. Uh, another thing I'll mention in the area of partnerships, too, is uh, we have probably somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 swimmers uh, in the city of Davis. Our city pools are highly valued. And the city council is very interested in figuring out some kind of a funding mechanism, again, where we can kind of provide the foundation, but the community might be able to come in and do some fundraising, maybe with some supplemental funds from the city to figure out how we can improve our pool system. There's great interest in a 50-meter pool uh, in Davis, and the council wants to figure out a financing mechanism to make that happen. It is very expensive to run pools, so this will absolutely have to be a partnership. Uh, but there is uh, the interest on behalf of the city in having a partnership in this, uh, this area. So any other questions uh, before, we, uh, before we wrap it up? OK, we've answered everything. Uh, thank you again to the Davis Vanguard for hosting this and bringing it forward. Uh, David, would you like to make any uh, uh, remarks to, uh, to conclude? Real quick, I wanted to sure. also make sure we recognize Sarah Worley is here. <laughs> very good. Uh, we, in our economic development uh, team, Sarah Worley. Sarah, thank you very, very much for uh, being with us tonight. She was hidden. You, she was <laughs> hidden. She was just looking like such a polite citizen back there. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't get it. Thank you, uh, Rob, very, very much uh, there. Good. OK, David? I wanted to thank the mayor again for, uh, for doing this again. I, I thought it was important that uh, the, the town folks, uh, all the citizens in the city get a, an opportunity to, to see this because this is a critical year that we're facing. Uh, we have elections, uh, we're gonna have decisions on, on revenue issues and, and we're gonna have decisions on economic development. And, and so laying it all out so that the citizens can understand in advance what we're facing is critically important. So again, on behalf of the Davis Vanguard, um, and I wanna thank my board who's uh, here in the audience as well um, for helping to put this together. Thanks for coming tonight, thanks.